Welcome to today's session on the urban mobility transition. My name is Stefan Wierland. I'm a senior researcher at the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy. So policy responses to the urban mobility transition are at the core of a broad range of research projects. And the mobility transition is also a topic in all kinds of formats, in workshops, in conferences. So basically, everybody talks about transformative change that is going on. Still, what the urban mobility transition is, is often not well understood. Our interpretations of what constitutes the transition are diverging, ranging from incremental technological innovations to profound changes of the mobility system and of the way how we travel and how cities are organized. This contribution gives an understanding about transitions. It builds upon scientific research, but also explores the role of cities and local governments in transition processes. So, as said, transitions are processes. They are processes in which systems, subsystems of society, or sectors profoundly change. That means that social needs, food, energy, the way we live or the way we move, are satisfied in a profoundly different way than before. And transitions do not happen at once, but they proceed in several steps and may take years or even decades. Now, it's also important to distinguish between different kinds of transitions. There are, for example, fundamental transitions, often also referred to as great transitions, that mean changes that affect the entire system of a society. Think of the Neolithic Revolution with the invention and diffusion of agriculture, animal husbandry, and permanent settlements. Or the Industrial Revolution, which marked the movement from agricultural to industrialized societies, including urbanizations or new working patterns. Now, there are also middle-range transitions, and that's what we are looking here. Middle-range transitions refer to subsystems or sectors of a society. For example, food and agricultural systems, the energy system, but also the mobility system. So if we're looking at middle-range transitions, we focus on what is called socio-technical regimes. That means we are looking at the configuration of system elements and the way in which they are organized. These system elements can comprise physical assets, such as infrastructures, technologies, or the availability and allocation of natural resources. There are financial elements, for example, the allocation of public money, the provision of subsidies, but also business models that are linked to the regime and investments of private and public investors, including their expected profits in the short and the long term. There are regulations, standards and laws which can form part of regimes. And also institutions, including ministries, dedicated agencies and interest groups, including their power to influence political decisions. Finally, there are social values and paradigms, means the ways that actors see and perceive the world. So these regime elements co-evolve over decades and align more and more. That means that the elements are interlinked and support each other. And the resulting mutual reinforcement of these system elements means that the regime is very stable, what is called lock-in effects. And the configuration of specific elements is called a dominant regime. Now, if we look at how the mobility system is organized in our cities, we find that in most cases we face car center transport regimes. That means we have dense and growing networks of car infrastructure such as roads and parkings. We have an allocation of urban road space with the highest shares going to motorized mobility. Um, similar high amounts of public money go into the road network and the car industry is one of the most important economic sectors in many states. So we have business models that are built around constructing, selling and maintaining cars. National level street laws often define that the fluency of motorized transport has the priority and which then limits the freedom of many cities to lower general speed limits, for example. Parking is considered a normal and legitimate use of scarce urban space and using a car is still the normal way of moving around in cities. And in mobility planning, the predict and provide approach, that means extrapolating trends and mobility patterns into the future, and then provide adequate infrastructure to meet demand is still common. And finally, a car is still considered a status symbol in many cases, whereas bikes are something for kids, for leisure, or for sports, and public transport is for poor people. But if you follow the debates in at least parts of the mobility sector, think of the civitas community, but also in progressive cities, you are aware of a lot of competing ideas and discourses that challenge individual elements of the dominant regime. Think of the urban space reallocation, the pop-up bike lanes, um, CO2 prices, mobility laws that prioritize active and public transport, um, CO2 targets that are formulated for the transport sector, 
and increased safe for mobility and climate protection ministries, but also the ideas of shared mobility, seamless mobility, innovation and data-driven flexible public and shared transport, and the idea of using instead of owning are some of those discourses that are around. But those discourses are not mainstream yet. They are not considered normal. They are rather what is considered niche in transition studies. And they are not so well connected and not stable. And there might also be new elements which are presented as transformative, but that are more in line with the existing dominant regime. The prime example is private e-mobility. It's clear that we will need electrification, including private vehicles and trucks, to achieve transport-related climate goals. But the approach of having private e-cars is more in line with the old car-centric regime. Think of the business models, subsidies, and the predominance of private cars and the business models behind all this, where they still contradict new elements. In the end, such solutions can link better into the old structures and stabilize the car-based regime rather than being a game changer towards the mobility transition. What we see today is a window of opportunity to challenge the old and sustainable regime, which is based on three developments. There are basic innovations that enable profound change. This is the digitalization that allows shared mobility, on-demand mobility, and mobility as a service, and e-mobility as a means to decarbonize the remaining transport demand. Second, there is internal pressure that destabilizes and delegitimizes the regime from inside. That means that motorized individual transport has reached its capacity in many cities, so leading to congestion while the urban space capacity is exhausted and no space is left to expand the system any further. And this is also because other road user groups claim higher shares of urban road space. And finally, there are persisting problems which have not been solved over the last decades, including accidents, air and noise pollution. And third, we also see external pressure on the mobility system, which is mostly related to the climate and the energy crisis. We see that CO2-related targets are formulated for the mobility sector, and rising fuel prices challenge the idea of affordable individual motorized mobility. To sum up until here, achieving a sustainable urban mobility transition requires more than only challenging one element or to introduce one innovation. It requires a strategic approach to overcome the lock-in effects that stabilize the dominant car-based regime. And this does not need to be done at once, but it can take years or even decades. The strategic approach consists of three main steps. First, to promote and to support new elements, be it technological innovations, cultural changes or new behaviors. Second, to simultaneously destabilize the old regime. And third, to integrate those innovations that seem promising into the new system. And of course, we need to be aware of innovations that are core transformative, but that stabilize the car-based regime. The first rule of cities is to allow and to support experiments, which is often called to provide so-called protected needs. These protected needs are rooms in which new solutions do not need to be profitable, or rooms with relaxed regulations in cases, for example, where the legal framework has not been adapted to new solutions yet. Think of autonomous mobility as one example. This can be done in the context of experiments or pilot projects. And the idea is to understand which changes need to be made to the existing regime in terms of infrastructures or in terms of regulations. The second function is often neglected compared to the innovation side. This is destabilizing the existing regime. First of all, cities need to understand which factors lock in the old structures and which can be influenced on the local level. And based on this, there are four major elements or approaches that cities can use to destabilize unsustainable patterns. This comprises what is called control policies to confine and to disincentivize motorized traffic. This can include excess restrictions or limitations of on-street parkings, but also financial instruments that make private car use less attractive compared to other options. The most prominent example is parking management. This also comprises changes in regime rules that meets legislation. For example, cities can pass mobility laws that prioritize active mobility and public transport, or introduce climate targets for the mobility sector promote a new planning paradigm, focusing on livable cities instead of efficient motorized transport. Cities can also reduce their support for dominant regime elements, including public finances and the allocation of urban space. And finally, it can institutionalize new committees and positions to better reflect the needs of all user groups. A third function is to stabilize and to diffuse these new solutions. What's important here is that cities have long-term orientation. This can be mobility-related targets in sustainable urban mobility plans, in climate action plans, or in city development plans. This can be, for example, model share targets or greenhouse gas emission targets. And these 
targets and objectives are needed to assess whether an innovation positively contributes to the urban mobility system. It's also important to regulate new solutions. This is currently the case with shared e-scooters in many cities. So here we see more and more attempts to regulate the use and the operation of scooters, but also to provide mandatory parking spaces. And finally, we also see that more and more cities have integrated such new shared mobility services into the public transport system, be it through the provision of physical space, means mobility hubs and public transport stations, or through the integration of public transport apps. To conclude, so transitions are systemic changes that go beyond technical innovations. They are reconfigurations of the urban mobility system and of the different system elements. The role of cities is to support and to integrate the new solutions. Transitions are co-developments of basic innovations, of societal values and paradigms, of behavior, institutions, and legal frameworks. And the role of cities is to support innovative solutions through experiments, pilot projects and the provision of as we call it protected niches, but also to destabilize the dominant regime, to disincentivize unsustainable behavior, and to stabilize and to integrate those new solutions that prove to be beneficial for the future mobility system. Thank you very much.